What if? What if you stopped telling yourself today, in this very moment, that you weren't good enough? That you had to be different? What if you embraced who you were in this very moment, as you were? What would that do for your life? What if you were bold enough to try all the things that you are sure would lead to certain failure, including but not limited to listening to your mother, shaving your head, moving from Boulder, Colorado to New York City, and potentially running around naked in the streets of San Francisco because that's legal there. So I learned. <laughs> what if you were able to tell the people you love most the things that scare you most? The things that if you knew today was their last day on earth, you would only hope you had the gumption to share with them. What would you start doing today? And what if you embraced honesty instead of turning from it so that you could have the most honest conversations of your life, the ones that are necessary and utterly fundamental for success? Because success is the art of getting out of your own way. What if? I'm sure a lot of you guys went to school and you, know, you grew up similarly to me. I grew up in Buffalo, New York, and I was Really about, I mean, I haven't grown much. I was about this tall, right? <laughs> I was like two feet. And I'm thrilled at the thought of going to kindergarten. I had really curly hair, was in love with Little Mermaid, hair down to my, way past my butt. And I'm sitting for the bus, or I'm standing, waiting at the, you know, at the end of my driveway with my Little Mermaid backpack, and I'm thrilled. I'm going to a place that embraces ideas, so I'm told. And I go there, and I can't read yet, but I'm told, and you see all these signs as you grow up, it's like, authenticity is great, be an individual, do the right thing. And I'm thrilled at the thought that I get to go to a place where ideas and passion and doing the right thing are allegedly really, really, really valued. I was the kid that, the weirdo, who walked around my block with a big garbage bag, because I was going to save the earth. I didn't want the ozone layer to deteriorate, so I was going to go and pick up all the garbage from my friends as they sat on the porch and watched me. Hey, Lauren. How you doing? Hey, I'm just picking up the garbage for you guys. You know, and I was a person that in fifth grade when I found out that Nike was using sweatshops, was relentless in, in explaining to my friends, listen, you shouldn't, you shouldn't wear that. They're, they're kids just like us, and they're exploiting them. Any cause that was, that was worth rallying for, I was there in honor of that. And what I learned at a very young age, that's a really hard life to live as a fifth grader. And it's a hard life to live as you get older, even. And so I used to come home in tears, upset that people didn't understand how important this was. From the ozone layer to, to Nike to making fun of the handicapped kids, right? The things that always, you know, standing in front and defending that. Like, why are you making fun of them? And so what I learned to do is throughout high school is that I learned to be quiet. Er. I learned to hide. As long as I didn't talk about certain topics, I wouldn't be made fun of. I wouldn't have to constantly put myself in front of people to be judged. Why is she weird? Boys didn't want to date me because I was too opinionated, too much of a strong female. And it was difficult. And so I just stopped talking. I stopped sharing my passion, thinking that's what I was supposed to do. And it really wasn't up until about two years ago when I moved to New York, and I decided that sort of intuitively, I mean, I left my real estate business, and I moved to New York City, deciding, screw that. I'm not going to be quiet. I didn't say it verbally, but I knew inside. I was doing loan modifications at Bank of America and collections. I was a person calling you if you weren't paying your mortgage. And what I learned from all of that is probably one of the most profound lessons of my life, and that's the one that I'm, I'm hoping will resonate with you today. We believe that to be successful in the world that we cannot be ourselves. We can't say what we want. We can't do what we want. We cannot walk around in a TEDx stage barefoot in pink pants with a shirt that looks like it's from the 1800s. You can't do that. I like this shirt, by the way. <laughs> that we can't do that. And I'm here to tell you that you're wrong. And I'm hoping that you're going to embrace that wrongness. The truth of the matter is, is that the more authentic you are, the more, the more of a refined version of yourself that you are, the more you show up in the world with your views and your passions, the more leverage you have, the more influence you have. Bold authenticity is a key signal of influence. 
When you are boldly authentic some, with someone, when you share your passions, when you share your truths, it is an immediate trust builder. And the more you do that over the long term, people begin to trust you because they know that whether they're in front of you or not, you are going to stand by your values. When the stakes are high, you're not going to crumble because they've seen you under pressure. They've seen you say the things that don't make you popular, but that make you right. It is an immediate way to build trust. For all of you that are in business, how does the CEO act in the boardroom versus the assistant? What is the CEO expected to say versus the assistant? What does he do? What does he talk about? How does he enter the room? Where does he sit? Most people think you need to be the CEO to act like that in your life. My argument is you can act like the CEO today. What you talk about, especially with influential people, earns you the right to sit at the, the winner's table, so to speak. If you don't show up authentic, authentically, if you don't say the things that you fear most that will, but will add the most value to their life, you're not acknowledged. It's like a minor league baseball player trying to play in the major leagues. It doesn't work. And so when I was doing sales at Squidoo at, tw at 24, not having any idea what I was doing, calling everybody up, hoping to sell something, what I quickly learned when I was sitting down with CMOs of major corporations is the very thing I didn't want to tell them was the very thing they needed to hear and the exact reason I was failing fast. And for six months, I cold called, I showed up at people's doors, and no one would pay me mind. I, in fact, I got the meetings, but I sold next to nothing because I couldn't tell them what I already knew in my heart. This is not going to work. You want to engage people, but you're doing the wrong things. Have you considered this? That's why I was dismissed. So the way you show up in the world dictates how people treat you. It dictates how they respond to you, how they trust you if they refer you to friends. The thing is that to be effective at being authentic requires a few things, right? You don't wake up in the morning. I'm not suggesting you wake up in the morning and say, you know what, I heard this great TED talk by this girl, Lauren. I think I'm going to run in the streets naked just for the hell of it. Why not? Let's, let's try it out. It involves a few things, and the first thing that I realized is when I was at Squidoo, or currently at Squidoo, and at the Domino Project, is what I thought I was doing is I thought I was creating partnerships, right? What's that archetype? I'm a VP of partnerships. What does that even mean? And I was trying to show up as that figure that I envisioned. But I wasn't close enough, I wasn't close enough to what I call my urgent message. Creating partnerships wasn't urgent to me. Someone else could do it. What I was really creating was authentic conversation. For the first time online, we were creating situations where brands and people could speak authentically, could have, real, have a real conversation, where they weren't bombarded with banner ads and just junk, where it was conversation and educationally based. We were doing something that no one else was doing, and my silence was killing innovation for every second that I didn't speak. So the rule is that if you want to be successful in being authentic, because I warn you, just as my friend Michael did, it's not an easy road. It's not you wake up in the morning and say, this is so easy, I'm going to be authentic my whole life. There are obstacles that come with that. The obstacles will be easier to cross the shorter that distance is between your current life and your urgent message, because it will not matter. Bureaucracy, red tape, judgments, none of that will matter when you know in your heart there is nothing more important to do than to deliver that message, because that's what you're here to do. The last thing is that, when, you know, when people, you guys like that? My friends are actually alive, thankfully. Um, you know, the act of being inauthentic isn't something I think people do intentionally. In fact, I, I'm arguing that people do it because they think that they have to show up in a certain way. I must wear shoes. I must wear this suit. I can't tell the CEO what I think because I'll get fired. And I'm not important enough to share my views. Who will listen to me? Who am I to create a blog? I really think that inauthenticity is a fear of rejection, a fear of being ostracized, and a fear of death. Death of who you think you are, how you think you're perceived by others. I'm a mom. You know, I'm a sister. I'm this and that. And actual death. When the stakes are high enough, you fear actually losing your life. On the 7th of 1955 in Montgomery, Alabama, the world changed forever. A young seamstress had just gotten done with a long day's work, and she was heading to the bus stop to make her way home as she did every day. She walks to the bus stop, she stands, waits for the bus to come. Bus pulls up. She makes her way up each step, 
pays the bus driver and sits down, glad to be able to put her feet up from a long day's work. And she makes her way to the belly of the bus, and that's where she sits. And she sits down with four of her friends. She's enjoying the bus ride. It's going along. And a new group of people get on the bus. There's a little bit of conversation, and the bus driver stands up and starts to scan the audience. And he looks at the young seamstress, and he looks at the four people around her, and he says to them, listen, you need to go to the because in those days, in 1955, racial, se racial segregation was legal. And the fact of the matter was that the young seamstress, Rosa Parks, was black. And that just, that wasn't acceptable. It was legal for them to say, Rosa, you need to go to the back of the bus. You are a second-class citizen. And because these four gentlemen that just got on the bus, they're white. And that makes them superior to you. So you need to go to the back of the bus. Please and thank you. I envision the man hovering over Rosa looking at her, sweat beating up on his forehead and perspirating under his arms. Maybe he too had a long day's work. Maybe he too was just enforcing the rules. Maybe he didn't even believe in it. Frustrated that this obstinate woman would knock it up. And the people in the bus staring at her, wondering, fearfully, thinking, you know, images of the clan in their head, what is her outcry going to cause? Fear for her family, her kids, and future generations, because that's how serious it was. That's how high the stakes were. And others frustrated that for sure their dinner was going to be late, right? Because they're on the bus, and now because of this woman's protest, they're not going to be home on time to eat dinner with their families. What Rosa did and what came of that is epic. It's what we all learn in school. She sat so that others could stand. Thousands of leaflets, she was released that night, thousands of leaflets were passed through the streets telling everyone about what was now a citywide protest to boycott the public transportation system. Thousands of leaflets. And for 381 days, people stood because Rosa sat. So the valor was not so much in the act of sitting. It was that they continued to sit every moment. In every single moment for 381 days, has anyone been to Alabama to know how hot it is? To walk the miles that stretch to work? Every step they took as a black individual was a sign of what they stood for in a white dominated community. In my opinion, there, are no, there is no stake that's higher. And they won. On November 1st, 1956, the Supreme Court ruled that it was illegal to have racial segregation on the bus system. Rosa sat so that others could stand. People argue, was it planned? Did Rosa really, you know, was she really an activist? Was it she was just tired and didn't want to get it? I don't care what it was. No one can say that she wasn't scared shitless. To be on a bus, to people over, to people standing at you, risking your life because you don't want to get up, because you are in that moment are saying, I'm worth something. What if she would have said it's just a seat? It's not a big deal. Let someone else sit. Let, let, I'm going to sit this one out. I've had a long day's work. I have other things that are more important. What does it matter? Let someone else take care of this. What would our lives look like today? What if people like Veronica said, the homeless will find someone else to, 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 to charter their mission. They'll find their own leader to help them out. I did my school project. That's all I need to do. I'd rather go, I'd rather go live in New York and be a really sexy fashion designer making dishwashers. She could have done that. But what I'm saying today is that you don't have to be Rosa. You don't have to protest the public transportation system. I mean, maybe if you're in New York, you might, right? No one likes the buses. But I'm not saying that. I'm saying that in your own life, you have enough power and leverage to speak your truth in a way that will have exponential impact. Every time your childhood friends make racist comments, <coughs> excuse me, and you say nothing, what is your silence really saying? And when your coworkers make homosexual jokes about gays, and you know that your cousin is secretly gay, what does your silence say? And when you submit a proposal to your company so that a sustainable movement could take place where there's no waste, no waste, 
and no one loses their job, and because your boss doesn't understand it, he says no, and you say nothing. What does your silence say? I'm here to tell you today that you are all on the brink of influence. Each one of you in the seat that you stand in today is on the brink of influence. <coughs> it's a bad time to cough, right, in the middle of a speech? <laughs> And my question to you is, what is it going to take for you to cross that chasm, for you to be able to say, I want to share what I believe. I want to enact my voice. Because the reality is that you can't. I need water. <coughs> Thank you. Excuse me. absolute worst time to get a cough when you get a tickle in your throat <clears throat> and that's exactly what I have <clears throat> excuse me the reality is that you can't move upwards in life unless you're willing to have unless you're willing to talk about the big fat elephants in the room so to speak you can't pierce the bubble that you sometimes find yourself in unless you are willing to have the most heartfelt conversations with the most influential people in your life, sharing your most valuable insights, the insights that you know that if only they knew of them, their lives would be changed for the better. Being boldly authentic is an elevator to the top for those bold enough willing to take that journey. <coughs> Excuse me. For those of you willing to take that journey. As Rosa Parks said, the only thing that bothered me was that we waited so long to make this process. So I say go. Share the thing with the world that's going to change it ten times over and stop holding back. Stop pretending that you're doing it for them, that you're afraid you're going to hurt their feelings, that you're going to be disliked. Because the reality is that you're afraid. And that's okay. I'm scared too. But it is not okay to hold back your genius. The very thing that only you understand, the thing that runs through your veins, the thing that you were put on this earth to deliver. That only you can do. So go and let your voice be your guide. Thank you.